Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the last big step that we're going to make, last big leap we're going to make for a while. With the Old Testament texts, we jumped ahead or skipped generations as we told the stories. If we tried to go generation by generation, we've been, I'll say mired, but not in a negative way. We've been stuck there again, but not in a negative way. We've been spending a lot of time in that uh, while trying to tell the whole story of salvation. But here, as we, uh, as we get into the Gospels, we get a little more detail on the day-to-day life of Jesus. And so we're going to spend a little more time here. Not too long ago, we had a big jump from the prophet Isaiah to the time of Jesus. That's more than than 400 years passing. And after Jesus was born, there's anywhere from, this is as scholars assess the, the timeline here, there's anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of years before the wise men show up. And today, although it's only one chapter later in Matthew's Gospel, 30 years have passed since the arrival of the wise men, taking us to the time of Jesus' baptism. And from here, we'll spend the next four and a half months with Gospel readings that cover three years of the life of Jesus Christ. And during Lent, we'll spend about seven weeks just talking about, I don't know, how long does it take to say the Lord's Prayer? A minute? A minute and a half? So we're going to spend about seven weeks just on that minute and a half of Jesus' life talking about the Lord's Prayer. But there's so much packed into God's Word that there's always something new to discover with each new, with each reading and each new hearing. I'll bring you up to speed on the the leap between chapters first, and I will do that by looking at what appears to be silence on God's part. I've often wondered why there isn't a better record of what Jesus' younger years were like. Are you with me on that one? Have you ever wondered, okay, well, Jesus is 30 or 28 or however old he is at the time of his baptism, and we get that he was born, and we get that he was very young with the arrival of the wise men. Are there any other stories about Jesus when he's little? Anyone else? Anyone? Right over here? Yep. What's the story that you're thinking of? What's that? Okay, when he's presented at the temple. Very good. Now, how old is he at that, with that story? He's 12. And that's in the Gospel of Luke. But outside of that, we don't get stories of, of Jesus in his younger years. Um, so I have, I've, I've wondered. I like putting the pieces together. I like following the flow of stories and figuring out what's happening in the meantime. And I also enjoy fiction writing, (laughs) something that that speculates on on what's going on in the meantime. But but there's generally silence in terms of God's written and recorded word about those younger years. And while we could fill the the gaps with fiction, maybe we just need to look again at what we are, at what we're told. Luke's gospel has Jesus and his parents going to the temple twice. Once, 40 days after he was born. And I had to look this up because I didn't really know what that timing was in the first place. According to the law of Moses, Jesus was presented at the temple 40 days after his birth. That's where we get the story of of Anna and Simeon. Next, Jesus goes with his parents when he's 12 years old, and the Bible, the biblical text says that they went according to custom. And that's the story of where Jesus is teaching in the temple, and they, are, they travel to Jerusalem uh, just according to custom, so the, the whole family goes, and Joseph and Mary are leaving, and they're like, oh, hey, where's Jesus? Well, they go back, and they look for him. They find him in the temple, and they're like, hey, Jesus, what, what's going on? He says, where, why were you looking for me? Do you not know that I must be in my father's house? Maybe not a question that they, that, that they were expecting. That's in Luke chapter 2. So those are the two occasions where Jesus is in the temple, and that sums up the recorded history of what Jesus was doing in those younger years. But it was right after that, right after this Luke 2 verse 49, where Jesus asks the question, and he's teaching in his father's house, it was right after that, Luke 2 verse 51, 
which tells us that Jesus was submissive to his parents. So what's he doing in those growing up years? Well, he's doing exactly what was expected of him according to the law and to custom and obeying his earthly parents. Um, I don't know, there's some young ones over here. I know Mimi, you like, you like reading. She actually just said in class on Wednesday that she would read 24 seven if she could and that school gets in the way of that, right? And so does sleep. But, uh, but when we read stories, and I'm thinking of, of, of fiction, novels, and I've read a lot of, I've said this before, a lot of what my kids have, have read or are reading. And I don't remember a story where it's about a, a young person, so 13, a teenage, teenage person, who just does everything he or she is supposed to do. Do you, do you read stories like that? No, they don't exist. That's not, that's not fun. They, you don't, you don't, well, and then he woke up in the morning, and then he listened to his mom and ate breakfast and got dressed promptly by 7 o'clock. You don't read that. Nobody, nobody cares. So Jesus does everything that he's expected to according to the law and to custom and obeying his earthly parents. It could just be that people aren't writing about this because there's no controversy. He just does everything that he's supposed to, and that's it. Reading his diary, I, I don't know if that would be too terribly exciting. There's no, there's no dirt. There's nothing, uh, nothing exciting there. So he's, he spends his early years obeying. And when he got a little older, it seems that, G, that Joseph, his earthly father, has, has died because there's no mention of him. It does, the Bible doesn't record that he passed away, but uh, it seems that he died. And that Jesus assumed the duties of an oldest son, taking care of his mother and siblings, again, according to custom. Basically, boring stuff that you wouldn't write about. But demonstrating that Jesus was a boy and a man of simple integrity who grew up in a good home with parents who only lost him once. That's not too bad. The Matthew 3 text all of a, just comes up all of a sudden. Then. We go from the wise men to the, the, the Matthew 3, and the text drops 30-year-old Jesus into our laps, along with 30-year-old John the Baptist, who was related to Jesus, a cousin, 30-year-old uh, John the Baptist, who was born a few months before Jesus. We don't know anything about John's growing up years either, but as an adult, he looked and acted like an Old Testament prophet. I'm not sure if he started that, uh, the, the hair and the locust eating and the honey and the camel skin wearing. I'm not sure if he started that when he was 13 in his rebellious years and they said, oh, that John is not, he doesn't look like he's you know, a civilized person, uh, but as an adult, that's what he's wearing. And as he does play the role of a prophet, he says what needs to be said, he wears the traditional prophet garb of the camel's hair and he eats off the land, there is no question that he was called by God to deliver the simple, perhaps singular message, and I'm going to yell now, so I'm going to cover up my microphone, the singular message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That didn't work really well, but sorry. Um, that is his message. That's the message that is given to us at the beginning of Matthew 3. Now, Peter's message, Peter the disciple of Jesus, his message in Acts 2 sounds similar. So we know it was a message that was important and one that continued. It started on, on one side of Jesus, if you will, before he, his public ministry, before his death, before his resurrection and ascension. And it continued on the other side of it. So it's the same message on both sides. Peter's message sounds similar. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now at the tail end of, of Peter's message, it says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's not something that John is saying, but we have that from Peter, and so that's the full message there. Uh, that was his message. And people came out to him, confessing their sins and being baptized by him. 
the general people were finding their way out to see John the Baptist, who was proclaiming this message. And I say proclaiming, it's not, it's a, that's a good way of, of saying that he was calling out, that he was yelling it, but there's emphasis, repent. There's an urgency to John's message. And the people who heard it responded. It seems like they told other people because they came out from the cities as well into the wilderness by the Jordan River where John was preaching. But not just, um, I'll say, run-of-the-mill uh, people came out. There were some leaders as well. The Pharisees came out. And the Pharisees, to sum up their position, they were the strict keepers of the law. There was written law, there was oral tradition, and the Pharisees kept it all. Sadducees came out as well. And Sadducees were basically priests who denied the existence of, of an afterlife. They denied the existence of the spiritual realm of heaven and of hell. And so there was no eternal reward. There was no eternal punishment. There was just, well, there was a focus on punishment in this world. So the Pharisees and Sadducees are among the people who are, are leading, who are the leaders of the day. They came out to see what was going on. Maybe they intended to be baptized, but probably not. Because for them, baptism was a thing, but it was only something that, that non-Jews would participate in because they were the ones that needed to be changed or converted or brought into the, the, the Jewish ways, the Hebrew traditions. So probably not intending to be baptized, but the message of repentance uh, unnerved them altogether. After all, as law keepers, what would it look like to everyone else if they repented? Ooh. They repented. That means that they had some sin to repent of or to confess. So how can you confess sins and still maintain your own righteousness according to the law? So the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had a, had a big issue with John's message. And that's why John goes after them. Because they don't see themselves as needing to confess. They have no need to repent. Well, we know that, that later Jesus will take issue with these groups too when, they, when the Pharisees try to pin him down as a lawbreaker and when the Sadducee, Sadducees ask tricky questions about the, the afterlife. So Jesus will deal with them as well. But John goes after them and hits them right where it, right where it counts, if you will, right in the heart, because that was the thing that needed to be targeted. He has some harsh words, brood of vipers. I'm not sure if we would use those terms today, but we might choose other words. But he, he, he targets them. But there's another person that comes along with the, the regular people from the cities, with the, the leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, along comes Jesus. This is his first recorded appearance as an adult outside of his hometown. And we don't know exactly where, exactly where he lived. I mean, we, within the town, yes. But we also don't know exactly where John was preaching along the Jordan in the wilderness, yes. But we guess that it's about 15 miles to get there, and he's doing that on foot. So maybe a, a five-hour walk. Jesus bothers to go there to see John. Along comes Jesus, who has no need to repent. He has nothing to confess, so no need to be baptized, except that he identified himself with those he came to save. He didn't grow up differently. He wasn't privileged. Jesus was incredibly human. His response to John was, Let it be so now. It gets all kind of wordy here. Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. He did what he was supposed to do as a youth, as a child. He does what he's supposed to do now, by custom and obedience. And by doing so, he leaves those Pharisees and Sadducees with no ammunition to use against him. We know that later, when Jesus would be put on trial and eventually... Uh, I'll say, be found guilty, hung on the cross, it was an unfair trial. 
he was found guilty of something that he wasn't guilty of. And he truly leaves the leaders with no ammunition, so they have to make up some stuff about him. Sometimes it's hard to do what you're supposed to do, isn't it? I mean, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all arrive at a, at a yes for that. As a parent, as an adult, I like to make it one-sided, so if we're talking about something that's hard to do, or it's hard to do the, the thing you're supposed to do, I might tell my kids, I don't think I've told them this, but you might tell your kids, go clean your room. And the answer is, what's the answer to that question usually? Do I have to? Why? No. <laughs> what's that? Sure, Dad, you actually, you would get that. Probably why is a pretty common one. Like, why do I have to? They might, they might eventually go and do it, but they'll ask why. It's going to get messy again anyway. Or uh, they might ask, do I have to go to school? Yes. Why? Or are we going to church today? Yes. Why? And sometimes we've got good answers for those questions, but often we're poorly equipped to answer the question of why. Because they can just ask, like, oh, do I have to clean my room? Yes. Why? Well, because it's dirty. Why? Well, because you made it dirty. Why? Because you're a slob. Why? I, that, that question can just keep going on and on until parents are, are, are fed up with the whole thing. So we're often poorly equipped to answer the question of why. But obedience has value all on its own. And we don't always need the questions answered for life to be good. 12-year-old Jesus didn't seem to, it's not recorded, didn't ask why he had to go to temple. 30-year-old Jesus didn't ask why he had to be baptized. He grew up submitting to and obeying his parents, earthly and heavenly. So he had great practice at doing the things that he was supposed to do. He continued that in his adult years. Like Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Parents, it's okay to be firm. I want to say demanding, and that's okay too. It's okay to require things and expect obedience of your, from your children. Let your standards be based on God's holy word and promises, not just on stuff you're making up, okay? But when your standards are based on God's word, you may require, you may expect obedience of your children and young ones. I know that there's not as many, so really this is just targeted at the Langfelts today. Uh, young ones, it's okay. I guess there's a couple over here. Uh, it's okay to let go of your pride, the thing that makes you ask why. Mom and Dad, you've got to prove to me why I should obey you, why I should do all the things that you're telling me to. Young ones, it's okay to let go of your pride and just do what you're instructed to do. This is your role as you grow up and as you grow into God-respecting adults. The Proverbs 22 verse is usually one that parents champion. Like, ah, I'm going to train up my child in the way he or she should go so that when they're older, they'll just keep doing all the same things in the appropriate way that they did when they were young. But I think this is a, a message for the young ones, too. That when you practice doing the right things when you're young, you will maintain that ability to keep doing those things when you're older. Train up a child, children, obey. So it's okay to let go of your pride and just do what you're instructed to do. We don't always need to know why as young ones or as adults. We don't need to always know why God's laws are what they are. But we can learn from Jesus. We can learn to trust and obey. We can learn from Jesus that we can and should trust God's direction. Not because the answer is because then everything will go well for you because we know that's not always the way it goes. But we can answer that 
we do these things because Jesus did. As God's beloved son, and we hear the voice from heaven saying that he is beloved, and it was pleasing to him that he was following, that, that he was obeying God's will. So may we all, young and old, seek to please God with our obedience to his will, according to his promises. In the name and the spirit of Jesus, amen.